and welcome to the 24th Annual Golden Apple Award. My name is Jake Levy, and I'm one of the chairs of the Committee of the Golden Apple. I would like to thank Phoebe Rosenfeld, one of my fellow co-chairs, and Molly Zimmerman, one of my other fellow co-chairs, who would like you to know that her full name is Amalia, to avoid any confusion. <laughs> so what is the Golden Apple Award? What are we here for tonight? According to Wikipedia, a trusted source by university scholars, <laughs> The golden apple is an element that appears in various national and ethnic folk legends or fairy tales. Recurring themes depict a hero retrieving the golden apple hidden or stolen by a monstrous antagonist. So we don't live in fairy tales or folk legends, although people thought a snow day at Michigan would only happen in someone's dreams. That happened this year. The golden apple award is actually based off a principle by Rabbi Eliezer ben Hyrkanos in the third century. He said to his students, Get your lives in order one day before you die. Because a person does not know when he will die, he must therefore have his life in order every day. To us as a board, it meant that the winner of the Golden Apple Award should treat every single teaching opportunity or leading opportunity as his or her last. Now this year is very special. We are extremely honored to recognize both President Mary Sue Coleman and Professor Victor Lieberman as Golden Apple Award winners. President Coleman has won the first ever Golden Apple Award for Outstanding University Leadership. And President Victor Lieberman, I mean, sorry, Professor Victor Lieberman <laughs> has won the 24th annual Golden Apple Award for Outstanding University Teaching. Congratulations to you both. <laughs> and although these awards are both individual and distinct, they go apple and apple. Teachers lead, leaders teach, the two are very connected. Victor Lieberman has inspired many students through his breadth of knowledge and his passion for history. For those in the crowd who, thinks you're, for those in the crowd who think you are history buffs, you have met your match. And President Coleman has been a key driver for positive change during her tenure as president. And she is leaving us with a campaign that will benefit future students for years to come. Before we begin, I would like to thank all of our generous university sponsors, especially our Hillel team and our amazing graphic designer, Bo. Bo, if you are here, thank you so much for all your help. And also all the friends who have helped the Golden Apple Award in many ways. Right now, I'd like to recognize any past winners of the Golden Apple Award. If you are a past winner of the Golden Apple Award, please stand and be recognized. I would like to say one quick apology to Shelley Schreier, the winner of the 2013 Golden Apple Award. Apparently the mock-up for the program did not match the actual output. The 2013 award on the program did go to Shelley Schreier. <laughs> Finally, I would like to thank our amazing Golden Apple team. Molly and Phoebe, it has been an amazing ride with you for this year. And I want to give a special shout out to my own Nana, who's coming for a intellectual field trip for her 85th, I mean, 45th birthday. <laughs> Again, thank you so much for coming, and welcome to the 24th Annual Golden Apple Award. While well, once a professor in her own right, the students of the University of Michigan now know President Coleman as an outstanding leader of our university. To the Golden Apple Committee, being a leader means being able to empower, take initiative, and represent the community by fully embodying its values. We believe President Coleman possesses all of these leadership qualities, and she has achieved great accomplishments in her time here. President Coleman has worked towards making our campus more environmentally friendly through initiatives like solar panel fields on North Campus and hybrid, hybrid buses, creating more interdisciplinary areas of study in subjects like digital environments and reproductive sciences, and even providing students with the opportunity to develop a deeper understanding of international traditions, values, and attitudes through the Challenge for the Student Global Experience Scholarship. 
With President Coleman's final fundraising campaign, Victors for Michigan, she is leaving behind a legacy that truly emphasizes her devotion and commitment to providing the university with the resources necessary to prepare its students to be the leaders and best. She has given so much to this university and its students, and for these reasons and so many more, it is my honor to give the very first Golden Apple for Outstanding University Leadership to President Mary Sue Coleman. Thank you, thank you very much. This has been a big day at the University of Michigan. As you know, we hosted uh, President Barack Obama this afternoon. And uh, the fact that we only learned that he was planning to come to the university late last week meant that everyone had to spring into action. So uh, you all know as well that this is his third visit to the university. And so as our crack team was getting things ready and talking to the White House about the planning, the question was raised, why does President Obama like so much to come to the University of Michigan? This is his third visit. And the White House responded, well, he always has a great experience here. The students are so enthusiastic and wonderful. He loves to come to Zingerman's, which he goes to each time, and your team really knows how to do a presidential visit. So I think we should all congratulate ourselves for doing so well. <laughs> I have to tell you that I am deeply humbled by this uh, award. It's certainly not something that I expected because, uh, as you know, I left the classroom uh, over 20 years ago. But I will tell you a few things. I know I'm listed in the program to talk to you about reflections on leadership, and so I'm just going to say a few words because I'm really looking forward to hearing Professor Lieberman's uh, last lecture. I think that's going to be terrific. Uh, I've thought a lot about uh, how it is that you take the lessons that you learn as a faculty member because there's nothing quite as important, I think, in dealing with students, lecturing to students, teaching them, seeing them grow as they progress through their academic careers and their time at the university that really gives you the tools that you need uh, to lead the university. So I'll just give you a few things that I've learned over my years. First of all, I do a lot of listening. I think that if if I'm not agreeing with people, and sometimes I don't, I have to make tough decisions, and I know that I'm gonna make somebody unhappy with the decision that I make because they may have a different point of view. But people deserve the respect of listening, hearing them, letting me hear what they have to say, and acknowledging that I've heard what they have to say, I just don't agree with it, and that I move on, and I can move on with the tough decisions that I have to make, and that has served me very well over the years. The second thing that I've learned is never to br burn any bridges. I've had to interact with people that I might really quite disagree with over time. I have to deal with people across the political spectrum. I have to interact with people who may have ideas about how the university should be run, not my ideas, but I don't burn any bridges. I never say, I cannot go back. I try to keep the lines of communication open. And the way I think about this is being relentlessly positive as I move forward. Uh, I'm not unrealistically positive, but I try to be positive because I think that's the way that you move the agenda forward. So those are the two of the things that I have that served me extraordinarily well. I will tell you that having been at five universities, my time at Michigan has been the most rewarding. I've been at wonderful places. But the time at Michigan has been the best. And I think the reason is because students at Michigan are so deeply engaged in the intellectual life of the university. The fact that you are all here today and that you care deeply about teaching and teaching being excellent as it is at Michigan. I don't think a university can be great if we don't have great teachers. But the students at Michigan are really what have made the difference to me. I interact with students not in the classroom regularly, but I hold fireside chats. I talk to various groups of students. And I am all, 
always come away impressed by how deeply people think about issues, the passion that students have about issues, and the fact that they are willing to engage me in discussion about uh, their hopes and dreams for the future. So I thank you all very much. I will treasure this award, and I will keep it in a very prominent place. Again, thank you very, very much, and thank you for being who you are. Thank you, President Coleman, for those inspiring words. One of the students who nominated Professor Lieberman for this year's Golden Apple Award said, Professor Lieberman is a god in human form. <laughs> now, when having to choose who will be the recipient of the Golden Apple Award, how can you say no to that? Another student commented, at the end of every lecture, I felt enlightened because of the way Professor Lieberman taught the class. There are only, these are only two of the many, many comments from students who both admire and relish Professor Lieberman's dedication to both his teaching and his students. Good evening. My name is Amalia, and I'm privileged to be here tonight, not only as a member of the Golden Apple Award Committee, but also as a student of Professor Lieberman. In this, my last semester here at the university, I am honored to bestow, bestow upon Professor Lieberman this prestigious award. Professor Victor Lieberman teaches in the history department specializing in Southeast Asian studies, but students from virtually every concentration at the university take his classes. I myself am a neuroscience major who typically runs away from history classes, but not this one. Professor Lieberman's passion for teaching is obvious from his devotions to answering any and all questions until he is sure every one of his students is comfortable with moving forward. Despite his busy schedule as a renowned scholar, he is committed to building relationships with his students outside of the classroom and offers them unyielding support. He treats his students like colleagues, challenging them to think by engaging in stimulating conversations and even allowing them to call him Vic. On March 13th, the Golden Apple Committee nonchalantly interrupted Vic's History 244 class and surprised him with flowers, balloons, and 24 spray-painted golden apples to represent the 24th Annual Golden Apple Award. It was evident from the enthusiasm in the entire lecture hall that out of the amazing 300 other individual teachers nominated, 2014 is Vic's year. The impression he has made on me, as well as hundreds of other students, invariably will last a lifetime. I now would like to call up Dr. Kathleen Canning, the History Department Chair, to introduce Professor Lieberman. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you my colleague, Victor Lieberman, the Raoul Wallenberg Distinguished University Professor of History and Professor of Asian and Comparative Studies, Comparative History. To the students who chose Vic Lieberman to receive this extraordinary honor, let me say that this award confirms a highly distinguished teaching record of three decades. Vic has been a rock star teacher since the first day I met him. He has been a role model for countless junior faculty, including myself, as they worked their way up the ranks, and for his GSIs who have learned from him the art of a lecture that inspires students while delivering the highest level historical interpretation. Whether in his longstanding teaching of the Vietnam War course or his more recent teaching on the Arab-Israeli conflict, Vic's capacity to attract students and his success in bringing his critical passion for history to the broadest body of U of M students is legendary. Students consistently note Professor Lieberman's erudition, allowing him to offer complex analysis without notes or PowerPoints. Students appreciate his willingness, as Amalia just said, to engage their viewpoints, questions, and challenges, both in the classroom and beyond its confines. Vic Lieberman is the model interactive teacher who makes clear that face-to-face -face teaching is still a vibrant art, one that should not be lost despite the rapid expansion of teaching technologies available to all of us these days. These are all things you know about Victor Lieberman, so let me tell you a few things you might not know. He graduated summa cum laude first in his class from Yale University, which was clearly a sign of more to come. 
From there, he went on to complete his PhD at University of London. He arrived at Michigan in 1984 as an assistant professor and quickly moved up the ranks to full professor in 1991. Every single book Victor Lieberman has written has won a major prize. His first book on Burmese administrative cycles, Anarchy and Conquest, was published by Princeton in 1986 and won the 1987 Harry J. Benda Prize from the Association for Asian Studies. From the study of Burma, Professor Lieberman took on a broad comparative analysis of Southeast Asian and European history with major forays into Japanese history as well. During the 1990s, his scholarly work became the focus of a special conference in the UK and a special issue of the journal Modern Asian Studies in 1997. An edited collection entitled Beyond Binary Histories, Reimagining Eurasia to 1830, featured scholars from all around the globe who grappled with Lieberman's emerging theoretical ideas on the rise and fall of Eurasian nation states. His two-volume magnum opus, Strange Parallels, Southeast Asia in Global Context, published um, volume one in 2003 and volume two in 2009, has been described by one reviewer as possibly the most profound work of large-scale comparative history yet written. Volume one earned the World History Association's annual award for the best book published on, in world or global history. And one reviewer noted, every beginning graduate student in any area of history should be required to read this book. Lieberman's curiosity about all aspects of the human experience is so dazzling, dazzlingly multifaceted that there's scarcely a page in the book that does not amaze one with the Catholicity of his interests. Vic Lieberman's Strange Parallels was the subject also of a featured review in the leading US historical journal, the American Historical Review, in 2012. Describing his study as the most important work of history produced so far this century, and there he has some serious competition, Emory hist historian Tonio Andrade noted, historians researching any period in any place should know this book and understand its challenging paradigms. Andrade concluded his review by writing that Lieberman's work had such power that it will surely shape generations of historians to come, asking what they should be called, those who've been shaped by Vic Lieberman. Foucault had his Foucauldians, Karl Marx had his Marxists and Marxians, Weber had his Weberians. What are we to call those who follow Victor Lieberman? Liebermanians, <laughs> Liebermen or women? Victorians? In any case, it is no exaggeration to say that strange parallels will inform our understanding of human history for generations to come. And this was in a review in the most eminent um, uh, American historical journal. So he's been the focus of enormous attention. Everything he's written has won a prize. I share with you all of these accolades so you know just how lucky you are to have this extraordinarily talented and distinguished scholar as your teacher. We in history certainly feel fortunate to have him in our midst. Following his last lecture, modestly titled, What I Think I Know About History, may we understand what it means to become a Liebermanian. And we are reassured that after this last lecture, there will be many more. Vic, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kathleen, for those remarkable, perhaps exaggerated, but remarkable words. Thank you very much. And my deep thanks to the Golden Apple Committee and all those students who supported my candidacy. I was as surprised as I was delighted and humbled by, by this honor. So thank you very much. Assuming this is my last lecture, although that sounds a little ominous at my age, what lessons about history can I impart? I've always been curious about the big picture, and I thought I'd take this opportunity to indulge that interest. 
If the historian's task is to determine where humanity has been and perhaps where we're headed, by definition, we need overviews. An aerial survey of a river yields a better understanding than walking along a small stretch of the riverbank. With the eclipse of earlier grand theories of history, including Marxist and Whig schemas to which I'll return, we no longer have a master narrative. We no longer have a plausible view of the river. To be sure, this is a problem only for people of a certain temperament. Many of the most respected historians remain happy to explore the richness of particular locales. Yet a growing number, influenced by rapid globalization in our own day, want to know how current trends relate to long-term global patterns. Like everyone's expertise, mine is limited, restricted to selected parts of East Asia and Europe between 600 and 1800. Now I'll necessarily focus on that sphere. But what I'm going to do this evening is to join my own research with scattered readings uh, from other periods to suggest in very schematic and preliminary fashion how we may begin to imagine a new master narrative. These are the questions that I'll ask. Why for many centuries was economic, political, and cultural integration in many parts of the world linear and progressive rather than oscillatory? Why did political and cultural consolidation become ever more rapid? Why did such trends correlate between sectors of Eurasia that had little or no contact with one another? In driving development, what has been the role of culture, of politics, of commerce, and of accident? One of the most graphic views of the past comes from the German cultural critic, Walter Benjamin's Theses on the Philosophy of History, wherein he describes the angel of history, quote, his eyes are staring, his mouth is open, his wings are spread. Where we perceive a chain of events, he sees a single catastrophe which piles wreckage upon wreckage and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay awake in the dead and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing from paradise. It's caught in his wings with such violence that the angel can no longer close them. The storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. This storm is what we call progress. Thus he captures the elemental energy, the ineluctability, the potential tragedy of change, and also the helplessness of the individual in the face of such change. I accept all this, yet while I understand why Benjamin, who committed suicide fleeing the Nazis, had a hopelessly dark view of the past, a pile of debris, wreckage upon wreckage, I reject his insistence on structural stasis. He saw endless catastrophe. I see continuous construction. I'm not so naive as to equate progress with happiness, but I believe that the ever more rapid movement central to our age, towards specialization and interdependence, continues a trend apparent for millennia. In my view, history is the story of an accelerating, multifaceted integration that has grown ever more geographically inclusive and voracious. Consider first these measures of accelerating productivity and integration, starting with demography. When people began growing crops, there are 250 million people on Earth, but by 1900, there are 1 1.6 billion. Today, the figure is 7.1. In other words, it took 12,000 years from the start of agriculture for us to reach our first billion, and only a century to add another 5 billion. But if gro growth rates have exploded, intensification is by no means entirely modern. The time required for the human population to double fell from 6,000 years at the start of the agrarian revolution to 900 years in the high middle ages to 200 years on the eve of the industrial revolution. Today, it's about 40 years. In short, we see a cumulative expansion, excruciatingly slow for millennia, which accelerated dramatically in the early modern and modern eras. Technology tells a similar story. If the transition from the first stone artifacts to Neolithic tools took two million years, 
Once, agri once agriculture got underway, pottery, metallurgy, and architecture followed in quick succession. Medieval commerce battened on the new systems of cropping, marketing, and transport. These facilitated the commercialization of agriculture, which was one precondition for urban industrialization with its, in, with its internal crescendo. <coughs> with its internal crescendo. <laughs> From 1995 to 1998 alone, economic growth exceeded total growth in the 10,000 years before 1900. By enriching aspiring overlords and eroding local self-sufficiency, Material expansion in turn nourished political integration. After the classical empires of Rome, Han, Chi Han, China, and Gupta, India collapsed, much of Eurasia entered a period of pronounced localism. But from the mid-first millennium CE, and with gathering speed thereafter, kingdoms made war and absorbed one another with growing efficiency. Thus, between 1400 and 1850, the number of independent polities in Europe collapsed from some 500 to 30, in Japan from 220 to 1, and in mainland Southeast Asia from 23 to 3. Yet as violence beyond national frontiers increased, violence within those frontiers plummeted. This was true both because modern states developed an ever-expanding repertoire of social controls and because education, religious reform, and commerce instilled higher levels of self-discipline. According to Steven Pinker, the annual homicide rate in the United States at its recent worst in the 1980s was only a quarter of the rate for Western Europe in 1450, and a 50th that in non-state societies. Cultural consolidation reinforced and reflected political consolidation. Throughout Europe and Asia, tribal legacies and anemic circulation long ensured that ethnicity, language, even religion remained highly local. Yes, during the late first millennium, European peasants became Christian, nominally Christian, and Southeast Asians became Buddhist. But those universal identities coexisted with local animus traditions and local ethnicities. As had been true for millennia, at the popular level, much of Eurasia remained an assembly of mosaic cultures. Gradually, however, from the 14th century and with increasing force thereafter, proto-national forms began to carve out a new cultural space between the universal and the local. Particularly around the periphery of Eurasia, the language and customs of each capital began to displace local traditions, haltingly French, English, Spanish, Russian, Japanese, Burmese, Vietnamese, and other official cultures absorbed provincial competitors. Universal religious affiliations remained, but after 1400, they often assumed a more patriotic, kingdom-specific character. At the same time, responding to market forces and to private patronage, specialized forms of art, food, music, fashion, and literature proliferated. But they too functioned not as self-sufficient geographic isolates, as had been the case in earlier millennia, rather as subspecialties within overarching grids, whether regional or increasingly global. Lethargic and halting though such processes remained to the early 1800s, they anticipated that far more systematic standardization of culture, that political nationalism, state schools, electronic communications, and mass consumption have made possible in our own day. In sum, the dynamism of contemporary economies, the power of modern states, the coherence of national cultures embody very long-standing trends. For centuries, ever more complex systems have been absorbing and refashioning encapsulated local units. Single-cell organisms have evolved into large multi-cell organisms. Although globalization lacked a stable political focus, coordination also became global. According to Ian Morris's Social Development Index, measuring energy capture, urbanism, information storage, and warfare, prehistoric Western Eurasia had a 2,000-year lead over the Far East. 
That lead shrank, however, until by the start of the Christian era, they had drawn even. Thereafter, until about 1700, social development in Europe and China moved more or less in tandem. And of course, with Europe's intrusion into the Americas and Sub-Saharan Africa after 1500, the once daunting technical and cultural gap between those continents and Europe narrowed steadily. And today, global flows of information and capital largely ignore state boundaries. But so far, I've said very little. I've said nothing about the dynamics of integration, whether national or global. How can we explain this cumulative integration? Why was change coordinated between far-flung regions as between Western and Eastern Eurasia? I invoke four dynamics. Climate, commerce, autocatalytic core periphery differentiation, and Darwinian competition. Apart from climate, which was an essentially independent variable, the other three factors were synergistic, which means that they were simultaneously cause and symptom of integration. For most of human history, certainly until the 16th century, climate seems to have been the chief driver of development. And this is hardly surprising, since hunter-gatherers and peasants, unlike industrial man, could not generate wealth outside the natural environment. When climate was benign, populations tended to expand, and when climate deteriorated, they fell. But by prompting compensatory adjustments, even a deterioration in climate could have beneficial repercussions, such as human adaptability and ingenuity. We have several examples of climatic transformation. The origins of agriculture lay in the sudden end of the last ice age, the Pleistocene, as that cold, dry, glacial world gave way to the warm, wet Holocene that has sheltered humanity ever since. By thinning the game on which hunters relied, and by increasing the density of carbon dioxide reliant cereals, the end of the last ice age, about 9600 BCE, spurred experiments with crop cultivation in the Mideast, China, and elsewhere. The resultant agrarian revolution in turn underwrote the demographic explosion, the turn to urbanism, the religious and administrative ferment that culminated in the empires of Babylonia, Persia, Rome, Mauryan in India, and Han China. So too, a period of extraordinary prosperity in Europe, China, India, and Southeast Asia between 900 and 1300 relied heavily on a phase of hemispheric warming known as the medieval climate anomaly. This extended the growing season in northern latitudes and strengthened monsoons on which rice cultivation depended in tropical Asia. Ultimately, the Gothic cathedrals of Europe and the stupendous temples of Angkor in Cambodia sprang from the medieval climate anomaly. Conversely, the transition from the medieval climate anomaly to the Little Ice Age in the 14th century joined institutional strains to convulse societies all across Eurasia. And then after 1500, recovery benefited from modestly improved climate, and more particularly from improvements in animal husbandry, transport, and finance that sought to compensate for antecedent climate-based disruptions. And such innovations have been, turned, been termed a harvest of adversity. So in these ways, climate contributed to substantial coordination between distant sectors of Eurasia. But if climate was cyclic, as why, as I've argued, why was social development linear? Because societies by their nature store information and retain best practices. Periods of favorable climate encourage population growth, which in turn raise total output, in many cases per capita output, through new systems of irrigation, crop rotation, handicrafts, transport, and other forms of economic intensification. These kinds of advances were not forgotten. But as I just suggested in referring to the harvest of adversity, poor climate could breed compensatory adjustments that also raised output and became part of each society's knowledge repertoire. In short, climate, or to be more precise, human response to climate, favored a ratchet-like expansion. As interregional trade increased, especially after 1500, best practices diffuse more readily from one area to another. Both developments, the accumulation of local expertise and the import of external knowledge, 
provided a resilience, a richness, an internal strength that gradually rendered societies more independent of climate. Now this reference to trade leads to a more general consideration of commerce, which by definition was the principal agency of interregional diffusion and which is our second dynamic of integration. Long distance trade helped generate the earliest Eurasian civilizations and contributed to medieval prosperity. But after 1500, the opening of maritime routes between Europe, the New World, and Asia sped goods and information with unprecedented ease over unprecedented distances. Potatoes, maize, and other New World crops began to feed poor people in Europe and in Asia. In the 18th century, Asian textiles transformed European fashion and manufacture. From Morocco to Japan, European-style firearms revolutionized warfare. Vast quantities of New World silver lubricated markets from London to Beijing. Along with climate, trade thus helps to explain economic convergences across Europe. I'm sorry, across Eurasia. And as Europeans and Asians exchanged cartographies, religious and artistic perspectives, they laid the foundation for a global culture that now seems set to dominate the 21st century. Local commerce increased at the same time as long distance exchange, helped once again by New World silver and by foreign merchant diasporas. Like long distance trade, local markets provided customers for ever more specialized foodstuffs, foodstuffs and handicrafts. The ensuing division of labor again boosted total and in some cases per capita output, allowing more people to support themselves on a given area of land. Far from being uniformly distributed, demographic and commercial growth tended to multiply in cumulative fashion the superiority of privileged districts, fertile river valleys and port cities over less favored areas. This promoted a core periphery differentiation that was simultaneously economic, political, and cultural. Along with climate and commerce, cumulative, self-replicating core periphery differentiation, especially from the late first millennium CE, therefore provided a third spur to integration. Even if core and periphery grew at the same pace, the core's initial economic superiority measured in terms of manpower, cereals, or trade, ensured a constantly increasing absolute advantage. But in fact, growth rates in each core typically exceeded those in outer zones, allowing each, capital, each, each capital region to pyramid its powers of coercion and attraction. Not only the scale, but the nature of each political economy changed. Across Eurasia, throughout the second millennium, we find a sustained movement from subsistence to market production and from in-kind to cash taxes and cash salaries by making it easier for the crown to extract resources and control officials. Monetization directly boosted control over the provinces. More broadly, by eroding the economic self-sufficiency of local communities, Trade rendered local elites themselves ever more eager to support, indeed to create, a central political authority that could protect markets, regulate currency, and redistribute commercial revenues. Cultural circulation had similar centralizing implications. Trade sped the movement of texts, consumer goods, pilgrims, clerics, and entertainers, all of which tended to privilege the language and the customs of cities and central places at the expense of provincial and village traditions. Everywhere after 1500, literacy rose sharply because new wealth supported more schools, while commerce lent literacy greater practical value. Wider literacy and numeracy dramatically improved royal, rec royal record keeping and tax collections. At the same time, literacy itself helped to standardize culture because, as I just suggested, it privileged books, dialects, and perspectives originating in each capital. 
Although, as the Reformation shows, religious literacy could be destabilizing, as a rule, religious reform also underwrote core dominance. In varying degrees, Reform Buddhism, Neo-Confucianism, Protestantism, and Tridentine Catholicism sought to align personal salvation with public discipline, to promote an ethic of self-control and community obligation, and to instill respect for hierarchy without a direct outlay of scarce central resources. Thus, religious reform complemented efforts by royal officials to pacify and to civilize rural life. Unique to Europe and its colonial offshoots in the 1700s were capital-based newspapers, periodicals, coffee houses, and salons where national affairs were discussed. Such institutions also tended to subordinate provincial to metropolitan expression. In the 19th century, national political parties and national propaganda in the schools, reinforced in the 20th century by radio, television, and mass circulation newspapers, squeezed people into central templates with unimaginable success. By 1900, Western states, their nerve centers in dynamic metropolises, already had four times more resources and organizational capacity than in 1800. So in all these ways, privileged political course continuously magnified their influence over their peripheries. A fourth spur to integration was Darwinian selection. That is to say, the triumph of the strongest, most efficient contenders in conditions of intense competition. Darwinian selection operated on an interspecies level. Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens absorbed and eliminated Neanderthals. It operated in the economic sphere. More productive crops displaced older crops. But arguably, competitive selection was most dramatic on the political level. As once independent principalities amalgamated, as warfare grew in scale and expense, would-be survivors were compelled constantly to strengthen their position. Most obviously, this meant adopting the latest military and naval techniques and building tax and administrative systems to support the military. More broadly, military competition meant deliberately growing the tax base through commercial and agrarian patronage. In order to instill patriotic identification, Aspiring centers also sought to unify aesthetic, linguistic, and religious practices and to weaken refractory minorities. And by appealing to snobbery and ambition, central patronage, at times unintentionally, offered a powerful spur to self-anglicization, self-Burmanization, self-Russification, and so forth. In sum, across Eurasia, Climatic shifts, trade expansion, core periphery differentiation, and interstate competition promoted ever fewer, more solid polities. As states grew more cohesive, successive interregna grew shorter and less violent. And as international linkages tightened, political rhythms in distant polities meshed more closely. We see this in Eurasia as early as the 10th century, but of course global coordination took off in the late 19th and 20th centuries, as Japan and China fortified themselves with Western knowledge, as military and political technologies grew ever more intrusive and efficient, and as international rivalries intensified. If the First and Second World Wars pushed international competition to a hideous extreme, the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 and Chinese economic reforms after 1978 reflected the same basic logic. That is to say, the price for systemic weakness is political subjection, and the remedy for weakness is to adopt the best practices of one's rivals. Note finally that while I have concentrated on proto-national and national political units, because from 1300 to the present, these have been the chief actors. Political, political consolidation occurred on a global scale as well. 
The best examples were the British, French, and Dutch colonial empires, which in the mid-1900s yielded to more informal empires focused on the United States and the Soviet Union. Now, so far I've talked almost entirely about the North Atlantic and Asia, but wasn't this supposed to be a talk about human progress generally? Certainly the same long-term tendency to integration as we find in Eurasia transformed Sub-Saharan Africa and the New World before 1500. Yet it's hard to deny that the pace was slower and the outcomes measured in terms of energy capture, knowledge processing, economic and military capacity was less dramatic. When Hernan Cortez and Francisco Pizarro arrived, the civilizations of the Aztecs and Incas, lacking wheeled vehicles, extensive literacy, metal tools, and beasts of burden, these civilizations in some ways were less developed than that of Babylonia in 1750 BCE. Two questions therefore arise. Why did Eurasia outpace other world regions, other continents? And within Eurasia, why did Europeans dominate Asia? The first question was the subject of Jared Diamond's Pulitzer Prize winning Guns, Germs, and Steel. To summarize briefly his widely accepted thesis, Eurasian success owed nothing whatever to intellectual or moral factors, but a great deal to geography. In particular, Diamond emphasized Eurasia's unique access to high-protein cereals and such domesticable animals needed for food and work as goats, pigs, horses, and cattle. Relatively abundant food and high population densities in turn generated an early division of labor which encouraged technological experiment and political growth in cumulative fashion. But with more limited biological endowments, the Americas and Sub-Saharan Africa lacked comparable grains and large domesticable animals. Also of critical importance, across Eurasia, east-west trade routes sped the movement of plants, technologies, and cultural motifs, encouraging a constant cross-fertilization. Hence the compression of east-west differences in Morris's development index to which I referred earlier. By contrast, in the Americas and Africa, severe communications bottlenecks and pronounced variations in climate and ecology seriously inhibited material and cultural circulation. Finally, because measles, smallpox, and influenza all originated with domesticated old world animals, Europeans, like most Eurasians, had substantial immunity. But the tragic susceptibility of Amerindians to those same diseases hastened their submission to European control. In addressing the second question, why did Europe come to dominate Asia and by extension the world after 1700, I would emphasize the interplay of geography with culture and institutions. From an early date, Europe's internal fragmentation by mountains and peninsulas fostered an unusually high level of interstate warfare, which drove heavy military and naval expenditures. In the 17th and 18th centuries, aggressive imperial and mercantile policies let leading European states draw unprecedented wealth from both intra-European and intercontinental trade. Especially in England, rising living standards, hence rising wage rates, increased the cost of labor relative to capital. This made investments in labor-saving technology and industry a more attractive economic strategy than labor-based intensification. The latter long remained the preferred, the preferred economic path in most of Asia. In England, easy access to coal reinforced the logic of industrialization, as did a scientific technical culture that emphasized empirical inquiry and mechanical experiment. More broadly, the European notion of progress, the assumption that institutions can be improved through the application of reason, 
encouraged across Europe all manner of economic and political innovation, often in the name of national greatness. Generations of bitter Anglo-French warfare heightened popular identification with the nation, as did unusually high levels in Britain, France, and Western Europe generally of literacy, publications, and urbanism. Through this combination of material and intellectual stimuli arose those twin features of modernity, those twin engines of European domination of the world, industry and nationalism. Finally, I should note in passing that secular national cultures, that is to say nationalism, also drew strength from two religious developments unique to Europe, namely the separation of the universal church from local kingdoms in the 11th century and the collapse of religious universalism during the, during the Reformation of the 16th century. Such was the logic of integration, however, that as soon as Western Europe and its American offshoots extended their authority to Africa and Asia, those areas began using the West's own material and political technologies to throw off Western control and to challenge Western leadership. Anti-colonialism became a dominant theme in the second half of the 20th century. In the 1970s, Japan showed the enormous potential of Asian economies, followed now by China. Thus, information flows have reduced discrepancies around the globe, much as in earlier centuries they did so across Eurasia. In short, this approach allows us to compare widely separated, superficially incomparable times and places. It identifies forces that transform the self-images and the life choices of commoners as well as elites. It finds in history an overarching unity and directionality. Now how does this approach compare to earlier grand stories about human development? Two of the most influential meta-narratives until recently were Marxism and what I call Whig liberalism. Classical Marxism argued that mankind will pass through successive stages of primitive communism, <clears throat> slavery, feudalism, capitalism, and socialism. Excuse me. The transition from one stage to the next is determined by changes in socioeconomic, I'm sorry, by changes in economic organization, which as it evolves generates new social classes and conflicts between classes. Under socialism, however, which is mankind's ultimate destination, all classes will disappear along with what Marxists saw as man's historic alienation from society itself. As represented most recently by modernization theorists and by Francis Fukuyama, Whig historiography also posits inevitable progress. In the Whig scenario, however, mankind moves not toward a classless society, rather toward ever greater liberty and enlightenment, culminating in Western-style democracy. Whig historians emphasize the long-term emergence of constitutional government and personal freedom. For them, the motive force in history is not class conflict, rather the power of reason, especially science, to liberate society from ignorance and arbitrary restraint. Now, if for convenience we dignify my perhaps half-baked ideas by dubbing them the integration paradigm, that paradigm shares with Marxist and Whig historiography three basic features. A, a belief in cumulative linear change. B, a conviction that change is accelerating. And C, a belief that technology and economics play a major role in generating such shifts. My integration paradigm, however, differs from Marxist and Whig historiography in two key respects. First, it's less teleological, less ethnocentric, and self-congratulatory. I don't posit an end state, a final resting point, 
whether a class of society or a liberal democracy in which historical development stops. I don't claim that any particular system in the past anticipated ideal forms in the present or eternal truths in the future. Marxism and Whiggery were both transparently self-serving ideologies that used history as a stick with which to beat contemporary villains. Marxists wanted to destroy capitalism, early Whigs to check absolutism and Catholicism. By contrast, I don't think I'm deceiving myself to claim that the integration paradigm is politically neutral. It endorses no particular outcome and is frankly agnostic as to what will emerge. I suspect that future integration will yield ever more exotic and by contemporary lights, unattractive configurations. But that's beside the point. I'm interested in an amoral process, not normative prescription. By extension, I don't equate integration with happiness. Classical Marxism, and to a lesser extent Whig liberalism, were neo-Christian insofar as they reproduced Christianity's optimistic view of history as inevitable movement toward liberation and joy. On balance, I suspect that social and material progress has increased human happiness. People usually prefer that their children not die before the age of five, which was common for millennia. But we know too little about past psychology to be certain that atomized, atheist, urban consumerism really is more comforting than peasant traditions of family support and religious confidence. Indeed, some recent work argues that urbanization in the developing wor world has produced big increases in depression and suicide. The second difference is this. I'm willing, I'm willing to grant culture far more autonomy than most classical Marxists and many Whig historians. Marxists in particular tend to assume that economic forces trump culture. But in explaining the European miracle, I just emphasized the critical role of such peculiarly European cultural traits as empiricism, progress, and religious fragmentation. In the latest international rankings of student scores in reading, math, and science, all seven of the top places went to East Asian Confucian societies with centuries-long traditions of scholarship and social discipline. Without military occupation, there's limited evidence that Western ideas of democracy can strike deep root in non-Western cultures. So these considerations suggest the capacity of cultural traditions to reproduce themselves for very long periods. Finally, I would also distinguish between my integration paradigm and social Darwinist theories that stress survival of the fittest. Yes, I argue that competition, military competition in particular, has been a central dynamic. But whereas the operative units in social Darwinism are stable, discrete entities, races, classes, or nations, I see no stable historical divisions. I see only ceaseless interpenetration of malleable forms. Both winners and losers merged into substantially new, evolving systems. Cores became peripheries, and peripheries became cores. And boundaries expanded continuously to incorporate new regions. So if this is where we have been, where may we be heading? It's perfectly possible, of course, that uncontrolled climate change, or nuclear war, or ecological exhaustion will halt integration or push it into reverse. But barring such catastrophes, if we project past trends onto the next 100, 150 years, it's likely that multifaceted coordination will continue to accelerate. It will, I suspect, be driven by the irrepressible inner logic of technology, illustrated, for example, by Moore's Law, named after the co-founder of Intel, which says that the computer capacity, that computer capacity doubles every two to three years. But in contrast to past history, the most visible signs of future integration almost certainly would be on a national, not, I'm sorry, almost certainly would be on a global, not a national scale. Now obviously, everything I'm about to say is speculative, 
but it's no less fun for that. So what, may, what might we find in the future? In terms of culture, we're likely to see those twinned movements of the last 600 years, homogenization and specialization, intensify and diffuse. As the internet universalizes the latest fashions, movies, sports, and music, as standard languages displace local dialects in rural schools and urban landscapes, as migrations from the countryside to cities and from developing regions to first world centers swell, languages and cultures around the globe are likely to become ever more uniform. Already one language dies every 14 days. By 2100, some estimate that half of the 7,000 languages now spoken on Earth will have disappeared in favor of English, Mandarin, and Spanish. At the same time, in great urban centers, intermarriage and social circulation promise to reduce long-standing ethnic and religious distinctions. Not, notwithstanding religious fundamentalism, which itself is, is usually a reaction against globalization, the materialist, this-worldly ethos that now defines Western Europe, China, and Japan seems likely to become universal albeit in some places still employing religious vocabulary. In consumerism, in popular culture, and in employment, we can expect ever more numerous and peculiar niches. Even more, clear, even more clearly than in the past, these will not be geographic isolates, rather subspecialties that define themselves vis-a-vis -vis other subspecialties in a global grid. Physical mobility, gender equality, and atomization may erode not only ethnic and religious differences, but inherited identities of all sorts. Although in some areas the decline of heredity in favor of achieved, the decline of hereditary in favor of achieved status is already an old story, in the future the mobile individual, separated from ties of family, ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation may claim an unprecedented sovereignty. Fluid ad hoc relations may eclipse multi-generational families, perhaps two nuclear families, and marriage itself. Biotechnology may reinforce that trend. If everyone lives to 120, how can marriage be a lifelong commitment? As the age gap between parents and offspring fades, what becomes of parent-child distinctions? In politics, the nation, which at least in embryo has been the focus of loyalty, of political loyalty for 700 years, the nation may retreat in favor of global institutions above the nation and of megacities below. In effect, this would reverse the post-1300 appearance of nations in the intermediate space between universal religions and local ethnicities. In the future, by definition, only global institutions will be able to address such transnational problems as climate regulation, governance of the oceans, world trade, and finance. But at the local level, megacities also may assume a greater role as humanity concentrates in vast conurbations that share a post-national culture and that increasingly resemble one another in form and function. Already, over half the world's people live in cities, and by 2050, it will be 70%. Although national loyalties, like provincial loyalties in France, will surely linger, they may not retain their salience in competition with global and urban institutions. Will cities become the main recipients of a loyalty now directed towards the more abstract, less easily imagined national community? Now the bad news in all this speculation that I provided, the bad news is that it may be very far off the mark. As the English philosopher R.G. Collingwood wrote, the historian's task is to know the past, not the future. Whenever historians claim to be able to determine the future, something has gone very wrong. 
But the good news is this. In 150 years, none of us will be around to say, I told you so. <laughs> so if, I, if I've entertained or stimulated you, I'm glad, and thank you for listening. Thank you, everyone. At this time, I'd like to call up the rest of the Golden Apple Committee, please. So on behalf of the committee and everyone here in the audience and everyone that has nominated Victor, thank you so much, Professor Lieberman, and congratulations on winning the 24th Annual Golden Apple Award. Uh, right now, um, in one second, don't run, we have uh, a nice reception of Zingerman's and some coffee and some fruit and some desserts for everyone. Um, please see that there are two autograph books on the circular tables, one for prof 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 <laughs> Professor Lieberman and one for President Mary Sue Coleman. Both of them will be rece receiving these books and we'll read through them for you. Um, so again, congratulations to both President Mary Sue Coleman Professor Lieberman, thank you so much for coming, and we look forward to seeing you for the 24th annual, 25th annual Golden Apple Award next year.